Last week we left here with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And the cross is just so powerful and wonderful to us. And uh, many events occur after Jesus dies on the cross. We read how the soldiers came by and one pierced Jesus in the side uh, with a spear. Joseph of Arimathea comes along with Nicodemus. And they take Jesus' body down from the cross and they take him to a brand new uh, tomb and lay him there and roll a stone in front of it. The Roman guards then seal the tomb so that no one can steal Jesus' body. And I think by this point, the religious leaders got the job done. They did their job. They silenced Jesus, finally. Last week we read chapter 27 of the story. How many of you are keeping up? Let me see. How many read 27 last week? This is good. Excellent. You guys are keeping up. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Now, it's Saturday, and at this point, the disciple, for the disciples, all hope is lost. Um, We see how they scattered on the night that Jesus was arrested uh, and and betrayed by Judas, and they feared for their lives, so they scatter. Uh, They don't want to suffer the same fate that their rabbi has suffered. So knowing that Jesus had died on the cross on Friday, the disciples sink into seclusion, seclusion, feeling depressed and frightened, distraught, confused, uh, and grief-stricken. And here they are, they're thinking, you know, less than a week ago, here was uh, their rabbi, coming in to town, riding on a donkey, and the people were shouting his praises, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it was just five days later that the people would be crying, crucify him, crucify him. And it's Saturday now. Jesus' body lays in a tomb guarded by a detachment of soldiers. And I can imagine the disciples in this room having conversations, probably filled with long periods of silence, but broken with phrases like, how can this happen? I don't understand. I don't get it. He was supposed to be our king. He was going to build a kingdom. Now what are we supposed to do? Now what are we supposed to do? See, for them, Thursday... Thursday night brought betrayal. Friday brought death. And Saturday, for them, I think, brought hopelessness. There was no hope for them at this point. Hopelessness. And I wonder how many of us live in this Saturday state of mind. How many of us are living in this Saturday state of mind right now, in between death and resurrection? feeling hopeless. I can, I, I can imagine some of you growing up, you, you held the, the, the whole world in the palms of your hands and you were ready to take on the world and maybe go to college, get a degree and make a name for yourself, live the American dream, have a family and have this great life and something happened to crush all that. Friday came and something killed your dreams and, and now you're living in Saturday going, now what am I supposed to do? Now what am I supposed to do? Friday brought death for Jesus Christ. Friday brought death for Jesus Christ. But maybe for you, Friday brought the news of cancer. Maybe Friday brought bankruptcy or Friday brought a troubled marriage. Something has happened in your life that killed every dream that you ever had. And now it's Saturday. And like Jesus' followers, you're trying to figure out what to do next. Where do I go from here? Fortunately, we know what happens for Jesus and his disciples on Sunday. We know what happens on Sunday. The women, they go to the tomb. Uh, They want to properly prepare Jesus' body for burial. And when they get there, they find, of course, the stone is rolled away. The soldiers are passed out on the ground. Jesus' body is gone, and an angel guarding the tomb speaks to them. In Mark chapter 16, the angel says, Don't be alarmed. You, You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. This morning, every time you see an exclamation point in our scriptures, I want you to think of a smile on the person's face that's talking. 
This isn't yelling at somebody. This isn't scolding somebody for getting something wrong. No, there's a smile on his face. When the angel says he's risen, he's excited. He's risen. This is great. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So Sunday kind of passes, and that night the disciples are gathered in this room behind locked doors, Sunday evening. All of a sudden, Jesus appears. And if you're Jesus and you take a survey around the room, you're going to notice there's one apostle missing. Maybe he had to go out and get some milk or some food for the other apostles. I don't know, but Thomas is not there. So what does Thomas miss out on? Thomas misses on Jesus coming in and showing the disciples his hands and feet where the nails were. Thomas misses Jesus showing them the the piercing in his side. I'm pointing over here. It's over here. The the piercing in his side. Jesus misses that, or Thomas misses that. Thomas misses Jesus breathing on them, this Holy Spirit. Thomas misses it all. We read these words in John chapter 20. Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. He missed out. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. Smile on your face. We've seen the Lord. This is great. We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to believe it. Now, get this. The disciples, while they have moved from Saturday to Sunday, Thomas remains living in a Saturday state of mind. For Thomas, Jesus is still dead. Life still stinks. It's hopeless right now. It's hopeless right now. And for Thomas, he's not going to believe anything unless he sees it for himself. Thomas is stuck in this Saturday state of mind between Friday's death and Sunday's resurrection. So how about you? I think some of you come into this room, you find yourselves surrounded by believers who are so convinced that Jesus is real and he's risen from the dead and you sit back and you go, man, I I just don't know. I just don't know about this Jesus thing. You're skeptical. Like Thomas, you say, unless I see something extraordinary happen in my life, I'm not gonna believe it. You know, unless, unless I see Jesus fix my marriage, I'm not gonna believe it. Unless I see Jesus heal me of my disease, my sickness, I'm not going to believe it. Unless I see Jesus do something really extraordinary in my life, I'm just going to sit back on the fence and say, eh, I don't know about this Christianity thing. Uh, unless, unless I see him help me with my finances or do this or do that, I'm not going to believe it. I'm, I'm going to just kind of sit back and say, eh. Like Thomas, you need a resurrection story in your life so that you can leave this Saturday state of mind and live in the hope and joy of Sunday. Some of you need that this morning. Well, Thomas got his resurrection story just a week later. And we read this, a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. They probably didn't need milk that night. (laughs) Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, here it is again, that exclamation point, peace be with you. Then he says to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. And I don't think Jesus chided Thomas here. I think he had a smile on his face like, come on, man. Stop doubting and and believe. It's, It's really I who's standing here. And Thomas said to him, again, another smile, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Thomas leaves his hopeless Saturday state of mind and and he starts living now in this hopeful resurrection Sunday. He got to see. He got to see it and so he believed. Now for some of you this morning, it's still Saturday morning or it's still Saturday afternoon and and you're you're trying to figure out how do I get to Sunday? How How do I get into this hopeful state of mind? You need a Thomas experience, you know? Over the next few minutes, what I wanna do is look at some of the results of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What happened because Jesus rose from the dead? 
And what I pray that as, as we do that, I'll, I'll go through the results of the resurrection and then I'll come back to them and apply it to where you are. Uh, and I pray that through this, God can move you from this Saturday state of mind to a Sunday morning, Sunday morning resurrection, a, a, a state of hope and joy in your life. So the, here's the first result. Write this in your notes on the back of your bulletins. The first result is this, the resurrection validated Jesus. The resurrection validated Jesus. It proves that Jesus was who he said he was. No doubt about it. Jesus was more than just this prophet who did good things and said good words. Uh, He was the son of God. He was the Messiah. He was the savior of the world. But many people today, they want to tell us that Jesus, he never rose from the dead. Many people want to say, ah, that's that's just a a made-up story. The Bible is just a made-up story by man. But if you look at the evidence, you'll see that Sunday came and went. And during that time, Jesus did rise from the dead. This, this wasn't some flash in the pan. Now think about this. Our entire calendar dating system is based around the arrival of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. B.C. Before A.D. Anno Domine. The year of our Lord. Huh. Imagine that. Thanks, Romans. They gave us the birth of Jesus Christ in our dating system. Pretty significant. Well, skeptics of Christianity used to explain away the validity of the resurrection by telling us that the prophecies in the Bible were just kind of inserted in there after Jesus came and went. They were just written right in there. You know, they, somebody took the, the writings of Moses and all these other guys and they said, hey, you know what, Jesus came, let's just put, kind of sneak him into this Bible. And, and that, that was pretty interesting. I mean, maybe they had something going for them for a while. In fact, it wasn't until the 20th century until something could actually prove them wrong. 1947, a young shepherd boy is walking along in the wilderness, throwing some stones in an area known as Qumran. He throws a rock into a cave and he hears some pottery shatter. What's he do? He goes into the cave to discover, what is this? Maybe a treasure. Oh, boy, was it a treasure. The boy walks into the cave and he finds this Jewish library, ancient manuscripts, scrolls. We know them as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Come to find out, these are manuscripts that are written way before Jesus ever walked the earth, some 400 years before Jesus walked the earth. Among them, among the writings, was found every single prediction of Jesus Christ. Till 1947, we didn't have any evidence. 1947 came, guess what? We got evidence. Jesus was predicted. He was prophesied that that this man was come. Everyone was in there. Where he would be born, how he would be born, how a friend would betray him for 30 pieces of silver, how he would be silent at his trial, that he would be executed among thieves, how his enemies would cast lots for his clothing, that the tomb he he would lie in would be brand new and that he would rise from the dead. Every prophecy was there before Jesus walked the earth. Hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth, these prophecies were written about. Jesus came, and he fulfilled every single one of them. If that's not enough for you to believe it, take a look at his followers. Jesus ascends into heaven, and his followers wouldn't, would not deny who Jesus was. Josephus tells us that nearly every apostle died a brutal death because they would not deny that Jesus died, that he came, that he died, was buried, and rose from the dead. They would not renounce that. Take some pretty strong belief, some evidence for somebody to carry through with their own lives and say, I'm not dying. I'm not going to live just just to renounce my Savior. James was beheaded. Simon Peter was crucified upside down. Caesar Domitian attempted to burn the apostle John in a vat of hot oil. Have you heard this story? He throws John in this vat of hot oil, and John, the apostle John, gets in there, and he's just swimming around. I could imagine a smile on his face. Hey, look at me. (laughs) Maybe do a couple dives in, you know. (laughs) Caesar Domitian was so freaked out by this, he gets John out of there, and he, he, he exiles him to the island of Patmos where he has his revelation experience. 
These men were willing to die because they were so convinced that Jesus was who he said he was. His resurrection validated Jesus as the Messiah. Plenty of evidence out there. I don't have time to go through it all. Jesus is the Messiah and his resurrection validates that. Second, second result of the resurrection is this. It, the resurrection defeated death. It defeated death. I admire the wisdom of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was a very smart man, very, very wise. He was always in a, in a war of words with a, a, this woman named Lady Astor. Churchill always got the last word in. One time Lady Astor said to him, Mr. Churchill, if you were my husband, I would poison your coffee. To which Churchill retorted, Lady Astor, if you were my wife, I would drink it. <laughs> Just a wise man. I love that. I wish I had that in my own life, you know, just to retort like that and, and be done with it. Uh, just a wise man. Not only was he a wise man, a great leader, but he also was a believer in Jesus. Did you know this? He believed in Jesus Christ. And uh, in fact, at his funeral, he had his whole funeral planned out. At his funeral, uh, he planned that a bugler would sit atop the um, St. Paul's Cathedral and play taps. You know taps. Signaling the day is done. The night has come. And what's interesting is that he also, Churchill also planned that another bugler on the other side of the cathedral, after silence filled the funeral service, he would bugle reveille, signaling that it's time to get up. A new day has dawned. Because Churchill knew Jesus had defeated death. It doesn't end in death for you and me and everybody else in this world. A new day has come. I am risen and gathered with Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Death has no hold on us, has no power over us. Why? Because Jesus defeated death on the cross. Question is, will your future have problems? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go through some trials in life. And our present will have problems as well. But the cross of Christ shows Christ's love. The cross of Christ shows his love. The empty tomb shows Christ's power. His power over death. Here's the final result of the resurrection. The resurrection restored hope. It restored hope. Saturday was here. The disciples are hopeless. They don't know what's, what's going to happen. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ brought hope to their lives. Mary Magdalene goes out Sunday morning. She's standing outside of the tomb of Jesus crying. And perhaps she's reminiscing over how Jesus drove out the seven demons from within her. This man loved her and cared for her and, and healed her and, and, and spoke with her and discipled her. And, and, and now... She bends over to look into the tomb to plan how she might prepare his body for burial. Jesus' body isn't there. Instead, two angels are sitting in his place and they ask her, Woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Through tears, Mary says, Well, they've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary. She turned around, uh, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. We see how devoted Mary stayed to Jesus after his death. While everyone's sleeping, Mary wakes up early in the morning. She shows up at the tomb to take care of his body. And Mary calls him Lord, teacher. She even offers, <laughs> she even offers to bring Jesus' body back to the tomb. <laughs> you get this image in your head? You know, I picture this little dainty lady, <laughs> you know, carrying a 175-pound body back to the tomb. I'll, I'll go get him. I'll go get him and bring him back. 
She's devoted to the Lord. Uh, uh, she calls him Lord after she realized who, who it is. And, and at this point, she, you know, she's not driven by logic. She's driven by love. And perhaps Jesus disguised his voice when he asked, who is it you're looking for? Why are you crying? But, but he couldn't disguise his voice when he said, Mary. Mary, the, the sheep, we've talked about this, the sheep recognized the voice of their shepherd. There was no way Mary could mistake the voice of her shepherd that day, that morning, when Jesus said to her, Mary. And I want you to know this this morning, the shepherd knows your name. He knows who you are. And he calls you by name. It may feel like Saturday to you, but it's Sunday. And Jesus is calling your name. Do you hear him? Do you hear him? I'm going to go back to Thomas. In that room, he, he's just felt Jesus' wounds. He has seen for himself that, that, that Jesus is alive and well and real and risen from the dead. Uh, so... Jesus has something to say to Thomas. I think it's really important for, for you and me to hear this today. In John chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. What's that word there? Blessed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Who's he talking about? Turn to your neighbor. He's talking about you. Tell him. He's talking about you. You believe even though you haven't seen him. Some of you, though, you're still stuck in this Saturday state of mind. You know, you need some kind of sign that everything's going to be okay. Maybe you need a million dollars to fall out of the sky. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Maybe you need a miracle in your life. Maybe, maybe you need God to heal your marriage. Maybe you're, you're living in this dark time in your life and it seems like all hope is gone and it's Saturday and you're going, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Whatever the case is, you just need God to show up and give you your resurrection story. You need to move from Saturday to Sunday. Jesus is calling your name and here's the deal. Let's go back through these three points. You have been validated through Jesus Christ. You have been validated through Jesus Christ. Your troubles in this life don't define who you are. Let me repeat that. What you're going through, your circumstances, your troubles in this life don't define who you are. They are not your identity. Oh yeah, the world may call you divorced. But Jesus calls you friend. Oh yeah, the world may call you poor. But Jesus calls you blessed. The world may call you a coward, or you may have been diagnosed with cancer, so you're called a cancer patient. You, you may have to deal with all these issues in your life. You may suffer from depression, and you may be diagnosed with uh, postpartum depression or po post-stress disorder, whatever it is. That is not your identity. Jesus calls you child of God. He has validated you in God. It may feel like Saturday to you right now, and you're going, man, life is hopeless. This really stinks right now. All hope is gone. There, there may be no light at the end of the tunnel, but Jesus calls your name. Do you hear his voice? John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, he says, how great. Here's another exclamation point, by the way. How great is the love of the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what you are. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are a child of God. With a smile on your face, do it. Let me see those smiles. You are a child of God. We should be excited about that. You are a child of God. You're not all these other things the world defines you, defines you as. That is not your identity you have been validated through Jesus Christ, God's Son. You are a child of God. That is your true identity. People, Sunday's here. Sunday's here. 
So what about death? You may feel like your circumstances control you. you, you that in some sense, maybe you feel dead inside because of what's happened to you. Your, your situation is so bad. Uh, it's just like pff, death. In the present, it reminds you of, of how bad your life is in the future. To you, it looks even darker than it does today. Um, but Jesus calls out your name. Do you hear his voice? Do you hear what he's saying? John chapter 16, verse 33 Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In me you may have peace. But take heart, Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. Here's that smile again. Take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Don't worry about it. In me you have peace. Jesus' resurrection defeated death. And in some, how, some way, somehow, Jesus will provide peace for you in your deepest and darkest times of trouble. He conquers that for you. Sunday's here. Sunday's here. Ah, some of you are still stuck on Saturday. I get it. You know, everything still seems kind of hopeless, like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. You get one problem solved, but there's another problem facing you, knocking on your door. No matter how much you try to dig yourself out of a hole, the hole seems to get deeper and deeper, and, and you're getting deeper and deeper, and you just have no way out. But Jesus calls out your name. Do you hear his voice? Matthew chapter 11. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Oh. Everybody do that. Take a sigh right now. Deep breath in and let it out. Oh. Jesus will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and I will find you, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Man, I know some of you are going through some rough times in your life right now. But through Jesus Christ, you will find rest. Do you hear his voice? Jesus can make you alive again. And he will give you rest if you abide in him. It's time to stop living between Friday's death and Sunday's resurrection. Saturday's over. Sunday's here. And Jesus says to you, like he says to Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. You are blessed in Jesus Christ.